So we move to the work of uh, Victoria. Um, you'll sometimes see his name written with a double T, Victoria. Um, that's because he worked, as many composers did, for a part of his life in Italy. So he was born in Spain. Um, he went to Italy um, towards when he was still quite young. Um, some people think that he almost certainly studied with the Palestrina. Um, and in fact, he, I think, succeeded him at a post in Rome. Um, and there was, by the time um, it was getting towards the end of the 16th century, there were three of them who were really quite famous and regarded as the sort of three masters of the era. So there was um, Palestrina and uh, Lassus and Victoria, and they really were quite renowned and well known in their time. So that meant for Victoria's point of view that he could, um, rather than stay in Rome to the end of his life, he preferred to go back to Spain and put a request in that he should um, spend his final years there and the sort of latter part of his career um, in Spain, which is what he did. Um, it is nice to compare this work with the Palestrina that we were looking for recently. Um, although both are kind of quite bright settings um, and I'll show you some a contrasting side of, of Victoria's side in a minute. Um, there's a simplicity to this which is uh, really beautiful. When it starts you're not quite sure. Um, by the way I've given you a, a, a click link to download the score if you haven't got it. Um, when it starts you're not quite sure which key it's in. It starts with a bare fifth and then it moves through a couple of keys before the text Quam Gloriosum um, how glorious um, reveals where the key is ending up. And remember, this was a time when people were not writing so much in keys as still in modes. Um, and it was moving gradually um, as we move out of the Renaissance era towards the early Baroque, um, moving away from modes towards pieces having a kind of key that they were, you know, you start and finish in. So we've got these simple chords. <laughs> starts to move. And by then we kind of know where we are in terms of tonality. The next thing I, I know, and this is a very bright and upbeat setting, um, the next thing I really like to point out is the wonderful setting of Gaudent from bar 18. You get this scale up a fifth, it starts as being up a fifth, uh, between the, the tenors and the altos and basses, very close together. Um, and, and that kind of real gives a sense of the, the music rising up and getting more joyful and a, a sort of very appropriate way to express the word rejoicing, gaudent. Um, so he's, he's really a master. This music seems, it's a bit like Mozart to me, in that I, I find, in that it seems very natural. It seems like these ideas came to him very easily. Um, it doesn't feel like it's intellectual music. It's just natural, expressive, beautiful, in a way quite dramatic. Um, he's not a composer who I understand who, who wrote sort of secular works at all, like Monteverdi, but... Um, but there's still a sense of drama, I think, within the, the structure of it. Then he's also, it's quite a simple piece in a way, only in, only in four parts, but he makes the most of those four parts. When in bar 28, he drops down, just takes, goes down to three parts instead of four for Amictis Dolis Albis. And first of all, we get the lower three parts. So there's a little change of texture there, feels a little bit more calm, um, having climbed up to the heights in the Gaudent setting. And then just by switching to the upper three voice, he, voices, he, he then gives another change of texture. Before finally um, uh, reinforcing the text Amictis Tollis Albis by introducing all four parts. Um, then he does the kind of opposite thing. We've had this rising scale of a fifth for Gaudent, and he mirrors this by um, a falling scale for sequuntur annum, 
um, following the lamb. And the tenors start that off in bar 35. There's also a play on the word, or not really a play, but a more of a kind of depiction of the word sequuntur, following, um, by using imitation at very close, uh, a, a crotchet apart. So we have the, and you get the sense of the S of sequuntur cutting through the end of bar 35. You get the three entries, tenor, bass, and then alto, um, just to crotch it apart at the end of bar 35 and the beginning of bar 36. Um, and he, he takes those three voices down. Um, kind of following each other, just batting the idea from one to the other. Then he does exactly the same thing with the upper three voices. in the next few bars. So it's a very tautly uh, written piece, quite short, quite simple, um, but but masterly written and very effective. And then he, he has this long note which the sopranos hold um, to sort of signal that it's going to be the end. And, and it's like the sopranos have decided, ah yeah, we've finished this piece, thank you very much. And they hang on to that note and wait for everybody else to finish and catch up. It's a really cleverly written piece, nice, simple, very characterful, quite dramatic and um, very elegant and, and sophisticated as well. Then I'm going to, after, have a sing along with that. I hope you've uh, done the warm ups and um, got your voices a little bit in limbo, um, but uh, limbered up, I mean. Um, after that, I'm gonna play you um, a beautiful recording by the Talis Scholars, conducted by Peter Phillips, as ever. Um, it's the first, and you need to be quite chilled out for this, so it's something to listen to in the evenings. Um, it's the f opening movement of the Lamentations, uh, the Victoria Lamentations, the perhaps his most famous work in a way. Um, sort of extended work anyway. Um, their settings um, for the days leading up to Easter and this one is the first movement and uh, is written for Maundy Thursday. Enjoy these two. 